Usually, a BMS technical submission is your first formal interaction with the consultant. It's an opportunity for you to impress the consultant and show them that you know what you're doing and you as the engineer or the company you work for are not a high risk to the overall delivery of the project. In today's video, I'm gonna run through some of the more common mistakes that I see when a BMS engineer packages up a submission and sends it off for review. So there are two parts to this video. The first is how you manage the technical submission process. Very important. And the second one is the information that you provide in the technical submission, which sounds very obvious, but you'll see in a few minutes that some very basic bits of information are not provided and nine out of 10 technical submissions that I review, and I do this almost weekly, I would have sent it back and ask a bunch of questions. It's a waste of your time, it's a waste of my time. So the first part is, every single time you send through a technical submission, so there's an email going, and you've attached a PDF of you know your control panel design drawings or your network drawings, whatever it is, in that email, also attach a PDF of your technical submission tracking register. It's a spreadsheet that every single time you send a submission, you add technical submission one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. every single time. The two reasons why I wanna do this is firstly, it reminds the consultant every single time of any previous submissions that they've forgotten about or are overdue. It's also useful if you're having a meeting with your customer or your manager, and they're asking you how's the design process going, you pull out your technical submission register and you show them here am I sending the submissions on these dates, these are open and these are closed. These are the important ones we have to chase down. Now I'm not joking, I did a very big hospital about five years ago, I was the BMS consultant, and honestly, I remember counting it up, I had reviewed over 100 BMS technical submissions across the sort of 12 month design phase of a massive, massive state hospital. So you have to have a process that is tracking exactly what's going on. Every single technical submission you send through, you attach your technical submission register. The second biggest issue with a technical submission, especially data sheets, data sheets of temperature sensors, servers, firewalls, all sorts of different things, is that the engineer just sends through a clean data sheet of the product and doesn't explain exactly which options are going to be provided. So when a consultant is reviewing a technical submission, when we read that, the purpose is that you, the BMS engineer, has read the specification, coordinated with your customer and all the other trades, and after the coordination piece is all done, you're then compiling a submission that tells the consultant this is exactly what we're going to be doing. If you send through a blank data sheet and you don't answer all the questions in there, it provides very little value. Let me give you a few examples of that. The Dell 340 is a very popular server for quite large commercial offices. And this data sheet is the exact data sheet that is frequently sent to me for BMS server technical submissions. And this first page just has a bit about the server. And the second page has all the specifications in it. Now, when I open this, I'm reviewing this technical submission. This is what goes through my head immediately. The first thing is for the processor. Which processor are you going to purchase? Is it the Intel Xeon, Intel Pentium, the Core R3 or the Celeron? Four completely different servers. Which one are you buying? This data sheet doesn't tell me that. For the memory, it says that it has a maximum of 64 gigabytes. It doesn't tell me if you're buying 64, 32, 16, or eight. What are you gonna purchase? For the drive bays, it tells us that you can possibly have up to eight 2.5 inch hot plug bays, or you could have four three and a half inch hot plug bays. It doesn't tell me how many hard drives you're actually gonna put into those drive bays. Are you gonna buy a single one terabyte hard drive 
or two one terabyte hard drives or one 256 gigabyte hard drives. Can you see how this data sheet provides zero value? It's a complete waste of time. All it does is it tells me the brand of server you're buying, the Dell. It tells me the module number that you're using, the R340. And because there's an R and not a T, I know that it's a rack mount server, not a tower mount server. So that, that ticks a few boxes, but ultimately it doesn't tell me the information because this R340 could be purchased in a configuration that is compliant or this 340 could be purchased with a configuration that is completely non-compliant. If you buy a Celeron processor with eight gigabytes of RAM and one hard drive, it's not compliant, it's gonna be rejected. For the power supplies, are you buying a single or a dual redundant hot plug power supply? On my data center projects, I'm doing two right now, they are specified with dual redundant hot plug power supplies. If I do a 50 story commercial office, which I did, I'm doing one now, or a 40 story commercial office for upgrades, I'm also doing one of those now, I usually specify them as dual redundant hot plug. For standard, say 30 story or 20 story commercial offices where we don't have server plus energy management system plus analytics, I would just go with a single hot plug power supply. The point is, what are you purchasing? When I read this, I'm gonna put about five different comments on here, send it straight back to you and ask you to resubmit this technical submission again, wasting both of our time. Now with this temperature sensor technical submission, I haven't actually reviewed a Fisala submission before. Um, I didn't want to use one of the actual temperature sensors from a BMS company in this video because I just didn't want to do that. So I just went to the internet and just grabbed this data sheet. So the Vesala temperature sense we've got here is just an example of what I usually see when I get a submission from any BMS company with their own branded temperature sensors. The first comment is always going to be, which one of these sensors are you actually proposing to use? Are you going to buy the one with the display on or are you buying the blank one? Now I know that you're gonna buy the cheap one because the lowest price wins, but you've still gotta tell me and confirm so that I know that. So sometimes if I'm being a bit sarcastic, I would make a comment and I'd say, please confirm which areas have temperature sensors with displays on and which areas have no display, even though I know you're not doing that. The point being, straight away, you haven't told me which one you're actually gonna be using and there's a massive difference between this one and this one. Now this particular sensor actually can be purchased with a RS-485 Modbus RTU or 4 to 20 milliamps or 0 to 10. So I'm definitely going to comment and say please confirm if it's 0 to 10, 4 to 20 or if it's a networked sensor. Another thing that often happens with temperature sensors, not this particular brand here, is that for two wire passive temperature sensors there's normally a selection that you could choose between like 1000 ohm, 10,000 ohm, you know, nickel, platinum, those different types of sensing elements, resistive temperature devices. And we never ever, we hardly ever highlight those. Now in my specification, the 1000 ohm is not compliant. It's not permitted. It's gonna be a minimum of 10,000. So if you give me a data sheet, you don't tell me exactly which one you're gonna buy. I'm gonna comment on that and send it back to you. Sometimes if you're gonna buy a pipe temperature sensor, there's an accessory to buy a thermal well, and sometimes that thermal well can be brass or stainless steel. Again, you gotta tell me which one you're buying, because I don't want the brass one, I want the stainless steel one. So most temperature sensor data sheet technical submissions that will get sent to me, they will usually go straight back with comments, because one of those things, plus other examples, usually are not confirmed in the data sheet so they know what you're buying. So this technical submission is for a firewall and this is actually the real one that was sent to me and here I've got my Brass Anderson, please resubmit. So this PDF was sent to me completely blank with no comments confirming any of the selections or what would be provided. Let's run through and see what my comments were. The very first thing I see here is a beautiful dashboard with some very interesting stuff on. I'm wondering, I hope we're going to get that. And I see that there's lots of different styles of this firewall of how it can be provided like you know small quite basic desktop versions and then 
rack mount versions, you know, lots more ports, lots of different features. That's got me thinking straight away. So the very first thing I read through here is it talks about this cloud management dashboard, Southwest Central, and there's some analysis of what's happening with the firewall. So the very first question I have is, is a cloud dashboard provided? Who interrogates the management and reporting tools? Is this by the BMS company or another partner? I actually had the BMS company's actual name in here, but what I'm saying here is, are you buying this hardware box and the cloud hosting features or is it a standalone solution? And if you're buying this cloud thing, which is probably complicated, who's setting that up and who manages that? What's the annual management process around the dashboard and diagnosing problems and things like that? So that's the first question. Really obvious. If you read this, you just think about it. It's an obvious question. In this section, it talks about all the different protection modules that are available. Your know, network protection, web protection, and it's pages and pages here of different types of things. And my question was, what will and will not be provided? Because often with these things, with just the basic purchase, the basic price, you get a few modules, not all the advanced modules. Second thing I said was, who engineers or sets up the firewall, the BMS company or another party? Because this can get complicated. Who maintains the firewall, its configuration and the backup? I don't want to just know about what you're going to do when you install it. What's happening for the next 10 years? Whose responsibility is it to maintain the firewall and the backups every year, keeping an eye on it? Who monitors for threats, failed attacks or breaches? Because what often happens is we install a firewall and we test it and we never look at it ever again. There's no periodic maintenance process to check the log files, what's going on. I want to know these things, it's very important. Please confirm which product will be supplied because there's a lot of different things in here and they're completely different what these products are. It actually turned out when the BMS company responded to my comments, the one they were buying wasn't even on this list and they had to send me another data sheet and we started all over again. And then right at the end, after lots of reading and getting very bored with this, I come across this section where it talks about licensing. So my comment was, please confirm what level of licensing is being provided and if any ongoing subscription service is required. It took the BMS companies three months to answer this question and it turned out that yes, there was licensing and yes, there would be an ongoing subscription service forever. And that was really important to work out because my customer never had a firewall before that, and now they did have a firewall. There was an amount of money that had to be added every year to the budget. Now we did take this up, it is important, we should pay the licensing, but this is something that we all have to understand upfront, the consultant, the customer, and even the BMS company. But none of these questions that I've answered, the BMS company know the answers to when they sent this through. They're gonna work that out afterwards. If you notice there that none of the comments that I made were actually complicated technical comments about the firewall, what it can and can't do. These are just normal comments, just normal things about who is going to maintain the firewall, who installs the firewall, exactly which one are you going to provide, and then all the other features, the dashboard, the cloud hosting, the different protection modules, which ones are we actually going to get, which ones are we not going to get. All those things should have been clarified in the submission right in the beginning it would have saved us three months of going backwards and forwards trying to tease out what we're actually getting. Now there are three reasons why I personally want to review a technical submission. There's three things I'm looking at. Take a moment and think about why do you think a consultant wants to review your technical submission? Why do you think they want to do that? You're probably right. You're probably thinking that a consultant, a BMS consultant, a mechanical consultant, they want to review your BMS technical submission to make sure that your design and what you intend to build is compliant with the specification. That's correct. That is why they're doing that. But I personally have two other things that I'm looking at, which in my mind are much more important than just the compliance piece. The first thing is that I ask you to send me a technical submission because I'm forcing you to think about the design and coordinate with everybody else early in the project. Because BMS engineers are very busy and they're not normally working on one project. They're working on three to five projects. 
So on my project, it could be that the BMS engineer is very busy on installation phase and commissioning phase and doing witnessing on three other projects and they just don't have time to work on my project. So when I ask you for a network design submission or a points list design submission, I'm asking you that because I'm simply trying to get the focus back onto my job and force you to do this at the right time. That's the first reason why I ask for technical submissions. The second thing I'm doing is when I get the submission back from you and I read through it and I do this almost every week, like maybe a week or two goes by that I don't review a technical submission, but I'm generally every week reviewing one technical submission for something across all my projects, new construction, upgrades, whatever it is. And when I review the submission, I will get an opinion on what your experience is and or maybe you're a good engineer, but you just don't have time to work on my submission. So I read the submission, and if it's quite a poor submission, then I'm thinking, okay, hang on a sec, there's a problem here. I need to put more focus on this project. There's a risk here to my project. If a good submission comes through, and I reviewed the first three te technical submissions, and they're great, I'm like, whew, this engineer knows what they're doing, they're allocating the right amount of time to the design, it's a low risk for me, I can sort of go focus on other jobs that need more of my attention. So just keep in mind that the actual nuts and bolts part of the submission, the compliance piece, in my mind, is the third thing of importance. The first two things, getting the design done at the right time and working out if the team working on my project has good experience and time to do it. You've got to understand that. So a little bit of effort to put through a good quality submission, it's gonna take the pressure off of me and the pressure off of you. So what is your call to action here? Like what, I'm, what we're talking about here is not very difficult. All I'm asking you to do is to actually present a submission that explains to me the outcome of all of your coordination with other trades and your thinking, and you're telling me exactly what you're gonna purchase, install, engineer, commission, and witness to me in six to 12 months time. So don't be lazy and send me a, a data sheet for a server, a blank data sheet. Don't be lazy and send me that because it, it tells me that you don't actually know if there's one or two hard drives. You don't know how much RAM you're gonna purchase or the process, you don't know that yet because you're sending me a lazy submission. Don't send me a lazy submission. Send me a submission that tells me exactly what you're gonna buy. How much warranty are you going to buy? My specification says three years. Have you met that tick in the box? I'm gonna check that. And most of the time, if you spend a couple of hours extra on a technical submission, you'll just reuse that submission next time. You'll just take it, copy and paste it, rename it, it's the next job. It's the same server you're using, it's the same firewall you're using, it's the same temperature sensors, valve actuators, damper actuators. Produce high quality PDF data sheet submissions and you can reuse them all the time. Now, if you've made it this far through the video, thank you very much. It's a lot of effort to do this. I will see you next time.